challenged in the Word today. Because as fathers, what we like to do is we like to fix everything, don't we? Nothing tears me out of the frame more than to see my girls cry. Because I want to fix it. Amen? I want to put my hand to it and fix it. But be challenged today in the Word of the Lord today as we lean in to the supernatural ability of our Creator. Amen? Amen. Psalm 62 says this. Let all that I am wait quietly before God. For my hope is in Him. Look at verse 6. He alone. Amen. He alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress where I will not be shaken. My victory and honor come from God alone. He alone. He is my refuge, a rock where no enemy can reach me. Oh, my people, trust in Him at all times. Pour out your heart to Him, for God is our refuge. Amen. David, in this passage of Scripture, many scholars believe that he is grieving in a moment where his son, Absalom, has turned and rebelled against him. No greater betrayal is of a son to betray his father. No greater feeling and grief that would be. But David presses into God, his creator. He alone is my rock. Amen? Amen? He alone. The title of the message I would like to share with you quickly this morning is simply that. You alone. Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for leading this hour. Father, we thank you for setting the table in worship this morning. That at the mention of your name alone, everything can change. That you alone deserve all the glory and praise. Father, open our hearts to what the Spirit would say to the church of the living God today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Wednesday evening, the title of the message was simply this. Press to the position of proof. The heavens declare the glory of God. Amen. It's not, and the enemy would love to twist, twist words, it's not that we are a people that would say, God, prove yourself to us. If you can't go, I mean, I've been driving over the region, went to Mountain City last night once again, ended up in Damascus, learned about the heritage of the Wideners. <laughs> You're a key people over that way, if you didn't know. <laughs> been driving over the beautiful area that we live in our region as we've been reflecting with the Lord and studying of what his revelation is in the region if you can drive through this region and come to a conclusion that there's not a God you got a big problem Amen. you got a huge problem we can step out on the sidewalk following this service today and realize that the invisible qualities of a creator are very visible. Amen? Amen. Amen? Through the beauty of where we live. The heavens declare His glory. Romans 1 says that we are a people without excuse. Amen? Amen? It's not that we are asking God to prove Himself. It's just the matter of fact that God loves to prove Himself. Amen. We talked about laying that foundation in the midweek conversation this week. He says, when, when he's calling his disciples in the first part of ministry, he says, cast out once again. And, and, the, and the apostle says, we have told all night. He says, go out and cast on the other side. What is Jesus doing? He's proving himself to who he is to them. Amen. He does it time and time again, does he not? He proves himself. Amen. What He desires to do in our lives continually is press us into positions to where He proves Himself on a greater level that when He asks us to go stand in a position to be a vessel to minister to many that we won't back away knowing who's got our back. Amen? Amen. David would have never stood before Goliath unless he had a confidence in the Lord because he already had faced the bear and the lion. Amen? Amen. 
What was God doing in the wilderness for David when the bear and the lion came after his flock and supernatural power of God came upon him and he slayed the bear and the lion? God was pressing David into a position of proving himself that when he would be called to stand before Goliath, there would be no question of whether that giant would come down. Amen. This is how God does our life. This is how He really proves us as He's positioning us to prove Himself. And this is what happened in 1 Kings 17. We're going to review very quickly, run through a model to give some understanding and we'll be gone. Now Elijah, who was from Tishri and Gilead, told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel is, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain, you know, that the children of Israel and Ahab, and, and they were hooked up with the prophets of Baal, and, and God was not going to have that. Amen? So he sent the prophet of God, he sent his servant, he said, The God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go to the east and hide by Keroth Brook. Near where it enters the Jordan River. Drink from the brook and eat what the ravens bring for you. For I have commanded them to bring you food. What is God doing? He said, man, everything's going to dry up. There's going to be a famine. There, there's going to be stuff going to happen. Obviously, if there's no rain or dew upon the earth, there's going to be some suffering. But what is he doing to Elijah? He's pressing him into a position to trust him by a water brook to believe God that he is going to give him water to drink and bring him food to eat. What is God doing for Elijah? He's proving himself to him. Amen? It's not rocket science. Drink from the book and eat what the ravens bring for you. For I commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him and camped beside Keroth Brook east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening. And, the, and he drank from the brook. But after a while the brook dried up for there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. So now what? Let's go to the next. What does he do next? Then the Lord said to Elijah, Now the brook is dried up. God has proved himself. Amen. Why does God press us into position and, and, and prove himself to us that we can trust him on such a level? It is always to minister to the next individual. What's the heartbeat of God? That all would come into repentance and that none would perish. So everything He's doing in your life is fashioning you as a vessel to be used in the harvest. Whether it's one-on-one -on -one or to a multitude, that's what's going on always. Amen? You say, well, I went through tragedy, I went through this. Well, you've been through some things. God's brought you through some things. Why? So you can sit down with somebody else that's going through the same thing and you can tell them, my God brought me through and He'll bring you through. Amen? Amen. This is all for the multitude of harvests. What did we talk about about a month ago? He's building a mature bridge. Mark and I were reflecting on that this morning. He said, you're called to be boards in a bridge. People are coming out of counterfeit. People are coming out of death. And they're going to drink from a well. He said, you are to be nameless and a faceless board of a bridge. Amen? He's maturing us to be a crossing port for multitudes. Mark and I were reflecting on that this morning. You go across town to Johnson City Planning Commission and say, we need a bridge right here. You can tell them we need a bridge over this gap. And if you don't have a statistical study that, that says it's worth it because a million cars pass through here, come on. They're not going to build a bridge. So what does that tell me? When God relates to us that He's building a mature bridge, He's not building it for one or two cars to pass by. Come on, somebody. Amen. He's building it and He's establishing it for a multitude. Come on. What does He do then? He reveals Himself one-on-one -on -one with Elijah by the water brook. Is everybody good? And then He goes to verse 8. Then Elijah, then the Lord said to Elijah, the water brooks dried up, go in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I've instructed a widow there to feed you. So he went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks. And he asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? As she was going to get it, he called to her, bring me a bite of bread too. But she said, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house and I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal and me and my son will die. 
Why is Elijah able to say this? Don't be afraid. Why? Because he's already been pressed into the position of proof by the water brook. God knew that there was a famine. God knew that there was not going to be rain. God knew that, that Elijah was going to be the enemy of the land. <laughs> At least the people thought he was. Ahab surely thought he was. And God says, go by the water brook. This is where I'm going to feed you and this is where you're going to have water. So in that pressing to position, see this doesn't make sense to us. At least in our flesh you would say, you better go hunt and gather some stuff because you want to die if you don't get something to eat. But what did Elijah have to do? He had to trust the Lord. Amen. You see, listen to me, daddies, this morning. Listen to me, fathers, this morning. You. Oh, how often is it that we get pressed into the moment to where it's stage four and all we can do is trust the Lord? Come on. How it happens. Well, this tragedy will come. Or something will happen in our life. And that's when we really get close to God. And we say, well, there's nothing I can do. It must have to be a miracle of God. What does your life look like if you actually walk with that kind of thinking before you get pressed into the tragedy? Amen. My God. Amen. Come on. I want to live my life in the supernatural power of the Most High God always. Amen. Come on, does this make sense? Come on. Elijah, he wasn't at the point of death when God told him to go to Brook Cherah. He wasn't at the point of death there. This was everyday normal existence, Tony. But what was his everyday normal existence happening? God was proving that you can walk every day in the miraculous. Come on, Amen. somebody. Hallelujah. He didn't do all he did for you just to experience the supernatural power of God two or three times in your life. You can, can my God, listen to me this morning. Amen. 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 You can believe God to come through. Can somebody say amen? amen? Elijah was pressed into the position of proof and he was able to say, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you said, but make a little bread for me first. He said, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the lot will be new. He's living out to the next vessel the same thing he just came through. When the brook dried up, he sent me here. And you will not run out of things in your containers until the time the Lord sends rain on the crops to grow again. Amen. Does this make sense? Press to the position of proof. You may be being pressed right now and you say, man, I really got to do something about this situation. I really got to do, I, I, Lord, I got to do something. I got I to gotta get moving on this thing. And that's where I'm at in my family right now. Lord, speak, Lord. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Because, of, no, it ain't because if you don't, I'm going to have to do this. Uh -huh. That's what God's trying to break from us. Come on, somebody. Amen. That's what God's trying to break off the generation. What did the house of Saul teach us as we studied that for so long? What did it teach us? The main thing the house of Saul made a mistake was they put their hand to stuff. I'm thankful for my father's generation. I'm thankful for my raising in the church. But listen to me. And they loved the Lord and stood on the word of God. Don't take this negatively. But I'm going to tell you what they relied on too much was their know-how, their talents, their ability, and their hard work ethic. Amen. Come on. I don't want to rely on my talent and my education. Listen to me. I want to rely. Oh my God, if you don't move, it's not going to get done. Amen. Hallelujah. Because we're not going to take this thing. This is going to be pure glory or no glory. Let's, come on, amen. amen. Ah, hallelujah. That's, that's a tough, that's a challenging message for fathers today. Why? Because we love to fix things. We love to put our hands and stuff, don't we? Amen. Come on. Sometimes, not sometimes, all the time, you need to trust the Lord. He was being pressed in the position of proof that he might be able to walk that out to the next individual. What happens next? But Elijah replied, give me your son. What happened? The lady's child dies. We hurry. We get back, get through this review. The, the child dies. The, the lady's, as her, her, her baby died. 
He took the child's body from her arms, carried him up to the stairs of the room where he was staying, and laid the body on his laid the body on his bed. Then Elijah cried out to the Lord, Oh Lord my God, what's going on? Everything's going good, right? The containers are full. Nobody's lacking. Everybody's eating. Everything's going good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. By and by. And then a, then a child dies. And Elijah says, no, wait a minute, God. Everybody thinks Elijah was perfect. Everybody wants to talk about the, the power and the spirit of Elijah. Absolutely monumental of God working in and through his life. But look right here. Elijah's learning. Oh, Lord, my God. Why have you brought tragedy to this widow who has opened her home to me, causing her son to die? He got a question. He said, hey, wait a minute, God. And he stretched himself over the child three times and cried out to the Lord. Oh, Lord, what is God doing? God, is, God has pressed Elijah into another position of proving himself. Amen. What messes up this whole model? Us putting our hands to stuff. And God says, we got to go right back around and get you somewhere where I can show you that I'm serious about your life. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The Lord heard, he, he, he cried out to the Lord, Oh Lord, my God, please let this child's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's prayer and the life of the child returned and he revived. Then Elijah brought him down from the upper room and gave him to his mother. Look, he said, your son is alive. Then the woman told Elijah, now I know for sure. God is training him and positioning him to the place of proof. God proved himself once again. And what's the result? She says, I know that you're a man of God and that the Lord truly speaks through you. Come on. God is getting this man ready for the showdown of a lifetime. Amen. Where I believe we are as a people in this call right now, I believe that he's doing a duality. He's doing it personally in your life. He is pressing you into position to prove himself to you like you have never known him before. That's happening personally in your life. He's taking you to another level. Come on. Because you'll never be able to face the giant. You'll never be able to face the showdown that he has planned for your life to stand in the gap for a multitude of people until you know without a shadow of a doubt that you can step in there. Listen, I don't need the king's armor. Come on. Don't worry about who's watching those little, that flock back home. God's got this. Amen. Amen. He, he, he's desiring for a people to emerge. That have been through the position of his proving. Come on, he doesn't have to. This is how he works. This is how he does in our lives. She says, I know for sure that you're a man of God. And what's the result? He's pressed into the position of proof for a multitude. At the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, see, he goes one on one with Elijah by the water brook. Then he goes, he said, all right, we're going to stretch you out a little bit. Let's go over here to Zarephath and let, let, you, let you minister this way and let me prove myself this way. Why? Because he's going to a mountain. At the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and I am your servant. Prove that, all, that I have done all this at your command. O Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Immediately. Immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down. He knew how to pray. Amen. Oh, Lord, bring this child's life back. Amen. And when he got on the mountain, and God proved in that moment, then he got on the mountain, he says, I know how to pray about this thing. Oh, Lord, God, prove yourself today. And he's reflecting, just like you proved yourself by the water brook, just like you proved yourself in Zarephath. Father, do it again for a multitude. Amen. Do it for a whole nation right here. Immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the crowd and cried out, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Just like the woman at Zarephath cried out, I know you're a man of God. Come on. Just like the, just like the result here, the Lord, He is God. Come on, somebody. Amen. 
This is what God does with our life. We squirm and we don't like it. And we say, oh, this don't feel good. I got to do something about this. I got to make a move. I got to make movement. I got to do something. And sometimes we just want to move for movement's sake. But I'm telling you right now, I've been sent of the Lord. Wherever you are right now, it may not feel all that great. But what God is doing is pressing you into position where he can prove himself to you. And you can go to the next village and say, our God is willing. This is what God is doing. And what does it produce? A new way of life. Amen. Amen. Why was Mary able to stand at the foot of the cross when her son was being, was being sacrificed for all of humanity and she was losing her son in the most treacherous and most tragic way because she had walked through being overshadowed of the Holy Ghost. She knew her God had a plan. Come on, somebody. Amen. She had been there. She had walked through this is a new way of life. You see, in the church being brought up all of these years, we've, we've, we've relied on traditions and religions and cultures and being able, well, we know how to have church. We know how to have a children's program. We know how to build this and we know how to build that. Listen to me. I don't want it if God's not building it. Amen. You know? Come on. It's a new way of life. God wants to, to break a generational curse of the house of Saul off this generation. And what is the generational curse of the house of Saul? Well, I saw this happening, so I did this. God wants to break that in your life. Come on. He wants to break it off of you. He wants to break it off of me. He wants to produce a new way in your life that says, no matter what, God is well able. I don't have to put my hand to this. God can do this. This is why God was so upset with Elijah. After the showdown, after the fire had fell, after the prophets of Baal had been killed, what did Elijah do? He tucked tail with, 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 with Jezebel. Said this. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. What does Elijah do? He reverts back to the old way of life. What does he do? He runs. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. Why be afraid? Lord have mercy. You've been fed at a water brook. Come on. Amen. Without you putting the first seed in the ground to harvest it. You went to Zarephath and supernaturally see the dead raised and containers of flour and oil never run out. Amen. Can somebody understand? This is your new way of life. Well, we better do this or we better do that. Listen. The next step for this call is God has blessed this call monumentally in this season. Would be go scout out the land and find a place and buy some land. But what if somebody out there has been waiting on the Lord to release land? Amen. Come on. Amen. What would we say? Well, this is what we go do next. I'm not saying we won't go buy land. I don't know. God ain't told me to do nothing yet. He ain't told us to do anything. Our, our tradition would say this. Go buy that and dig you know, and get ready. Or, does anybody still believe that somebody could come to you and say, God told me to give you 30 acres? Amen. Come on. Does anybody believe that still? Amen. It's a new way of life. Amen. Tradition, the house of Saul. See, Saul gets antsy at the time that the war comes. And he says, I didn't even make sacrifice before the Lord. Come on. He gets antsy and he says, well, I better do something. See, that's what the house of Saul. That's what, that's what our heritage, honestly, I'm going to be honest with you. Why do we have man central rock star preachers now where everybody just gets starry eyed over man? Why? Why did that happen in the history of the church? And we're still dealing with the fallout of it right now. Why did it happen? Because man had done so much and put their hands to so much, it became so much about man, it couldn't help but birth that. Come on. 
Amen? But what would it look like if God had moved and man had just trusted God to move and God supernaturally just put Man wouldn't have had anything to do with it. They wouldn't have said, well, that's because brother so-and-so did this or brother so-and-so did that. And, oh my goodness. We got pictures of preachers on walls and sanctuaries. That's not of God. Come on. Man. I was in Greenville, South Carolina about three weeks ago and billboard-sized posters in a lobby of a mega church with a pastor and his wife on there like you was going to some circus. I'm sorry, that's not of God. My, ah, it's getting quiet, but that's the truth. Let God be the central of it all. Pastor, do you want us to put uh, something in honor of you and memory of you? Whoever God does with this call, don't you dare think about it. It's not about anything that me. Come on, unto Him. Amen. Amen. We get starry eyed and buy every book and linger on every word and all this. Part. My God, I wish somebody would get starry eyed about Jesus once again. Amen. Hallelujah. I've been, I started meddling. I'm sorry. <laughs> God wants us to walk in you alone. Look at this model. Look what Jesus modeled to us and we're out here. Now Jesus was standing before Pilate, the Roman governor. Are you the king of the Jews? The governor asked him. Jesus replied, you have said it. But when the leading priests and the elders made their accusation against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear all these charges they're bringing against you? Pilate demanded, but Jesus made no response to any of the charges, much to the governor's surprise. Now you understand that Jesus is very God, but yet very man in the flesh as He walked this thing in the earth. Is everybody good? Amen. He's overcome. You have troubles in this world, but take heart, He has overcome the world. Amen. He knows what it feels like to be you. Amen. So understand, look at Jesus following this thing. Obviously, you know this is the time of the crucifixion. This is the plan of God. This is the will of God. This is, come on. This, He thought about you. On the years down the road, Jamie's going to meet a Savior. Amen. The plan of God. Jesus, very God, could have stopped at any moment in time to change anything. Could He not? Amen. Do you agree? Amen. But what did He model? He was silent. He was silent. Look on. Some of the governor's soldiers took Jesus into their headquarters and called out the entire raiment. They stripped Him and put a scarlet robe on Him. They wove thorn branches into a crown and put it on His head. And they placed a reed stick in His right hand as a scepter. Then they knelt before Him in mockery and taunted, Hell, King of the Jews! Jesus has been beaten, he's been flogged, and they spit on him and grabbed the stick and struck him on the head with it. When they were, when they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. Jesus could have stopped it all right there. But what was Jesus modeling? He says, I will. Listen to me. This is the pure glory of God. I desire to walk in the pure glory of God. I don't want it contaminated. I don't want it tainted. I don't want our hands to touch. Come on, amen. It's not. I'm telling you, you get pressed into a place, into, into a, a tight squeeze, and every little thing will set you off. <laughs> you, know, you know? How tight do you think it was on our Savior at this moment? And he never put his hand. He never touched it. He never said, I'm getting out of here. He's never said, I'm stopping this thing. He said, he never touched the glory of God. After they nailed him to the cross, the soldiers gave him for his clothes by throwing dice. Then they sat around and kept guard as he hung there. A sign was fastened above Jesus' head, announcing the charge against him. It read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two revolutionaries were crucified with him. One on his right side and one on his left. The people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Look at you now. They yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well, then if you are the Son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. Jesus never made a move. Amen. I'll never forget one time I was with a senior minister. I was young in the ministry. And he took me 
to be a, an associate minister at a funeral. I'll never forget this. And I went, and he kind of directed me. He said, this is what you do. This is what you do next. And at the end of everything closing, he walked in front of me. He looked behind me. He said, and that's how you do it. It was like, I figured this thing out, and I'm going to teach you how to. Tony, I don't want to ever have it figured out. Because if I've, given, if I've got it figured out, you know, I've shut the door on the supernatural ability of God to take over. Yeah. Amen. Come on. Amen. What's the point of it all? For His glory to be on such display that it draws men, women, boys, and girls from the harvest. Not you on display. His glory on display. Amen. It says, save yourself. Jesus never made a move. Come on. The leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed. But he can't save himself. So is he the king of Israel or is he? Let him come down from the cross right now and we will believe him. They're begging him to put his hand to the plan. We will believe him. He trusted God, so let God rescue him now if he wants for him, for he said, I am the Son of God. Even the revolutionaries who were crucified with him ridiculed him in the same way. Jesus never moved. Come on. Amen. I work in a factory over in Irwin, Tennessee that makes naval fuel. Nathaniel's worked there, Jamie, KG, all of them. We worked there. If they even think that somebody did something to contaminate that product. It's scrapped. Not that if they know. <laughs> if they even think. Come on. Amen. I don't want to ever be in any kind of position where I contaminate or touch the move of God. Amen. Why? Because it gets scrapped. <laughs> Come on. Amen. We have to go back through. God's going to have His glory. Amen. Jesus didn't touch it. What happens when we are a people that absolutely let God take control of our lives and quit touching every aspect? We trust God for this if somebody gets sick. Or we trust God for this, but we don't trust God for the everyday existence. Oh, we got that. We got that figured out. We know how to make money. We know how to do this. We know how to do that. I don't want the old way of life. I want the supernatural power of God, the new way. Come on, amen. amen. What happens? The resurrection day is the most glorious thing in the history of the world. Amen. When we live a life that says, God, have your way. I'm going to quit meddling in your business for my life. What does it produce? Maximum glory for Him and maximum benefit for you. Amen? Amen. Come on. Amen? When Elijah trusted God, he ate. Amen? In a time where other people didn't have anything to eat, he ate. Maximum benefit for Him. Maximum glory for God as we retell the story today. Amen. Amen. What happens? Now after the Sabbath first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the two. And behold, there was a great earthquake. Quake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and it came and rolled back the stone from the, from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said, the one, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He is risen, as he said. On Father's Day, we're talking about that good Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. Listen, quit meddling and doing my God. Somebody needs to hear this morning. Quit trying to.
to do and solve your situation by putting your hand. God has sent me to tell you this morning that He is more than well able to bring you through and He's desiring to prove Himself to you like you have never known before. Amen. Quit messing with it. Quit trying to touch it. Quit trying to come up with some sort of resolution. Get on your... What does this drive you to? Pastor, how do I live life that way? You've got to move according to His voice. Hello. I saw a pastor marquee yesterday from a church on Boone's Creek Road. It said, if your job was to pray, would you still be employed? Come on. That's the truth. I'm glad they put it up there. That's the truth. What does this drive you to? How did Elijah move? When the brook dried up, God said, go to Zarephath. Maximum glory for God, maximum benefit for Elijah. Does anybody get this? How do you... How, this is a new way of life that Jesus made a way by overcoming death that you can now commune with the Father and the Father with you and He can tell you what to do. Why is it at the crux of this call, at the very foundation of everything we say in this call, you better have a personal prayer life or you're going to mess it up. Amen. Amen. Come on. It's a new way of life. What, do I, what job do I take next? What, what, what step do I take next? What thing do, do I go here to run? He'll tell you. Amen. Because His plan is perfected for you. Why do we get ourselves in such situations and messes all the time? Because we put our hand to it. What God is trying to do is break generational curse off of you. I don't want the, the understanding from a generation of how to conduct a funeral. If i got a funeral, I go before the Lord and He'll show me. Amen. Amen. i got to preach this come, you know, next, next Sunday. You know what? I don't want... I want to get before the Lord and say, what would you have, Father? I don't, want, I, don't want to, I don't want to take a man's opinion. I don't want to get a sermon book of illustrations. It's my God. Amen? Amen? I don't want that. I want the voice of Almighty God because He knows what you need, when you need it, how you need it. Can somebody say amen? amen. He knows the perfected word and the plan. Listen, Ezekiel 18, we're about done. What, you ask? Doesn't the child pay for the parent's sins? No. For if the child does what is just and right and keeps my decrees, that child will surely live. The person who sins is the one who will die. The child will not be punished for the parent's sins. And the parent will not be punished for the child's sins. Amen? Amen. What is God teaching us here? Generational curse can be broken. Amen. I do not have to walk in the ways of the house of Saul because a generation before me walked in the ways of the house of Saul. It can be broken off of my life. Can somebody say amen? amen. amen. I don't have to walk. Well, this is what you do next in ministry. How about we just get on our face before God and but walk by the voice? Amen. amen. Let Him prove Himself. Max glory for Him. Max benefit for you. Amen. If you're thinking about putting your hand to a situation right in this moment, I've been sent of the Lord right now. Come on. Wait on Him. Wait on the Lord. Listen for the steel. Why was he so upset with Elijah when he hid in the cave? He said, what are you doing here? You've got a new way of life. I don't care what Jezebel said. Have I not proved myself enough to you? This is what you do next, Elijah. Amen? Amen. Get out of this cave. Come on. Ah. What is he saying right here? He said, the generational curse that plagued the generation before you does not have to be carried by you. It can be broken. Amen? The child will not be punished for the parent's sins. The parent will not be punished for the child's sins. Righteous people will be rewarded. Come on. And wicked people will be punished. Breaking generational curse of the house of Saul. Amen. Amen. Help us, Lord, this morning. Psalm 62. 
Somebody retrieve Samantha. She has a word of the Lord. She wants to share this morning. Psalm 62. She's in the back somewhere. Courtney, go get her. Where's she at? Get over here. Please, sweetie, honey. Come on. <laughs> Let all that I am wait quietly before God. For my hope is in Him. This is your way of life. Amen. Amen. This is your way of life. You don't have to do that. Well, things ain't moving there, so I'll go try another church. That's what the generation did before you. Well, that one made me mad, so I'm going to go over here. That's what they did before you. If you want to carry that same generational curse upon your children, come on, somebody. Yeah. Ah! If you are led by the voice of God to another ministry, hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. But if you just act, my God, come on. Amen. Ah! Amen. You can continue. Don't pass that to your children. Enough's enough. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on. What does he say? Let all that I am wait quietly before God. David is in such a spot right here, his own son is rebelled against him. Trying to kill him. For my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. God's trying to prove a people into such maturity. That it doesn't matter what Mark says about me next. Good or bad. Come on. It doesn't matter who tried to hurt my feelings last. Come on. Because Elena, you're not my alone. He alone is my rock. Ah. Let the generational curse be broken. Why do we have four million churches on every corner in Upper East Tennessee? Because that crowd got mad at that crowd and split and went and built another one. Come on. We're not going to always agree on everything. We always ain't going to be happy and chummy and cheery. But God alone is our rock and our refuge and He can bring us through. Can somebody say amen? Come on. Teach a generation that you don't have to divide and be conquered, but you can be united and stand. Amen. Amen. Listen. It's not your way of life. That was the house of Saul. He alone is my rock, my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. <sighs> oh, I got messed up in that Wednesday. <laughs> I was teaching the proving model Wednesday. Not that we ask God to prove Himself. This is what He does, right? Amen. Somebody said, I believe it's a sin to ask God to prove Himself. <laughs> oh, that irritated me. I said, I didn't never say that one time in the message. <laughs> but I don't need to look at that. I need to look at this. Alone you are my rock, Father. My fortress where I will not be shaken. My victory and honor come from God alone. He is my refuge, a rock where no enemy can reach me. Oh, my people, trust in Him at all times. Pour out your heart to Him, for God is our refuge. Hear the word of the Lord today. Come on. Hello. So, you know I never get up here unless I absolutely have to. And for two weeks... Um, yeah, two weeks ago, I felt like God gave me this, and I fought getting up to share it, but he wanted me to, so I'm going to. Um, it's Father's Day, and I'm so appreciative of all you fathers here in the house and all of our men. Um, it seems like society has been trying to weaken our men, and it completely breaks my heart to see it. Um, so I'm coming to you today, I believe, with a word from the Lord, but I want to <coughs> encourage you and remind you of some things. And I also want to tell you um, a few statistics at first, because when I read this, my heart was broken. And forgive me for having to look down, but I get super nervous up here, and, and I really wanted to share my heart, so I'm going to have to read what I wrote, okay? Um, listen to these statistics. When a mother comes to Christ, her family will join her at church only 17% of the time. 
But when a father comes to Christ, his family joins him 93% of the time. 93. On any given Sunday, there are 13 million more, 13 million more adult women than men in America's churches. 13 million. This Sunday, almost 25% of married church-going women will worship without their husbands. And listen, I highlighted this one because it stuck out so highly to me. Over 70% of the boys who are raised in church, 70%, will abandon it during their teens and 20s, and many will never return. 70% of your sons. More than 90% of American men believe in God. Five out of six call themselves Christians, but only two out of six go to church on Sundays. The average man accepts the reality of Jesus Christ, but fails to see any value in going to church. 90% of children ages 8 to 16 have been exposed to internet pornography, most often while doing homework. And it has become such a large industry, it's $57 billion, and it produces more revenue in the U.S. combined than professional football, baseball, and basketball all together. A father's relationship with his daughter will often determine the kind of relationship she chooses. Parent connectedness is the number one factor in preventing girls from engaging in premarital intimacy and engaging in drugs and alcohol. That's how important you are to your girls. And listen to this paragraph that I found. A father's own spiritual example is crucial. How his kids perceive his relationship with Christ and whether it is driven by passion or whether it is driven by religious duty is crucial to the kids as they grow up. Kids are watching all the time. When kids pick that up, pick up that it's also for men, the boys grow up more likely to follow Christ. The young ladies grow up more likely to choose husbands that will be men who will follow Christ. There is a robustness that comes to the family when the dad is the one who is the spiritual leader in the home. And when dads are the spiritual head of the home, everything changes. The, that was statistics. Those are just things I read. This is what I feel like the Lord said to me. Men of the house, I have a challenge for you today. Don't be part of the statistics. These are, these are house of Saul statistics. We have all been called out of that. That means that you are called to be different, to be what God has called you to be and what biblical models have shown us. Um, when I was praying for this, I was praying for um, Noel. And when I was pregnant, everybody always said, Oh, I, I prayed for the man that my daughter was going to marry, and I prayed for my kid's spouse, and I was pregnant, and I was like, yes, I'm going to pray for Noel's husband. Mm -hmm. I do, every now and then. You know, it's like I always thought, yeah, I'll pray for that every time I pray. I pray whenever it comes to my mind. But as I was praying that day, I, this was one of the times where God brought that to my mind, and I started praying for Noel's husband, her future husband. And I was thinking about that husband's parents. And I started praying for her husband's parents because her husband is going to learn from her husband's father. He's got to teach her. You know, he's got to show her the examples. Um, so men with sons, you are raising my daughter's husband. Come on. I mean, think about it that way. You're raising my daughter's husband. Um, you have to be the example. And dads of daughters, you have to show her what a husband looks like you've got to show her that think in your mind as you're treating your wife or, or doing and you all could be completely awesome i'm just saying this is what the lord gave me um you have to think do i want my daughter to be married to me because that's who she's going to pick that's who she's going to pick and you're you're raising your children's you're raising your children's father so your grandkids are going to be raised by the person you're raising think about that I reflected on our family as I prayed and wondering what kind of wife we are raising Noel to be. She has seen a lot and we are very open and honest with her. Then I thought about what she sees when she looks at her father as a man, as a husband, as a pastor, and as a dad. And when I wrote that, I felt the heaviness of that for you men. That's so heavy to think about the load that you guys carry in your house. Is her dad perfect? Absolutely not. Has he messed up more times than we can count in 20 years of marriage and 13 years as a father? Yeah. <laughs> yes. But 
when it comes, and Elena taught me a long time ago, when you use the word but, all the things before but doesn't matter. Come on. Everything that you say after but does. That's right. Say, and I put but in all capital letters. But when it comes down to it, I will tell you this. He is the pillar of our family because he is intimately connected to our Heavenly Father. He leads us in the best of his ability as he follows the Lord. There's no wavering, and we can count on him without fail to take us before God and then lead us as he has led. This is what she sees. She sees an imperfect man that believes without question in a perfect God. A man that with everything that he has with everything that he has to follow God because he wants to please him first and because he knows his responsibility is to lead us to God. And when he does that, it allows me to be the mother that I'm supposed to be, to be the caretaker and the nurturer. I don't have to stand up and be the one that leads our family to God because he does it. Not that I don't. I pray for my daughter. But I don't have to be the one to take that responsibility. Am I saying this to brag on Jamie? No. I don't do that very often. He knows that. I'm saying it because this is what I pray my daughter will look for in a husband. Dad's your daughter need to see, needs to see a steadfastness in you and your relationship with the Lord that causes her to see that the standard for the man she chooses for her husband, she wants to see that standard in her father. Your sons need to see the same example because that is their foundation as a husband and a father themselves. Your impact on your kids' lives is so much greater than providing food, shelter, things, and experiences. As I was praying that day, I really felt like the Lord showed me a picture of what our call should look like. <coughs> I saw a large tent, like ones um, that a circus or a huge revival would be in. And that represented, in, in my vision from the Lord, our call with the tall, thick, strong pillars supporting it. You know, they have huge pillars. Each pillar was one of our men and their families were standing around them. I felt so strongly God saying that the myths will be different. Our men will lead and they will support when statistics say it is the women that are the backbone of the church. Churches are weak and dying now because not all the men are in their proper positions. Our call has to be different and we will thrive in all that God has called us to do when we are. I reflect on fathers today, but this is for all of our men. Because not all of you might be a father, you might be grandfathers, or you might just be spiritual fathers to somebody. Is this a reprimand? Absolutely not. It's a reminder and an encouragement. You heard me say I believe Jamie is doing a great job, but he also needs to be reminded he is modeling a husband to Noel and that other men are watching how he lives his life. And the same for each of you. I'm so excited to see what God is going to do in our call as our men lead us. We can and we will impact this region for the Lord and you men are essential. As you lead your families to God, you will see his kingdom come to earth. This is your challenge and I know you're ready for it. The mighty woman of God prophesied over Samantha that she would come out with a voice. And I see that come to pass today. I reflect on ministry to go forward, and I say, God, she's got to be with me. I witness that today as she brings the word of the Lord. What better vision that she brings from the Lord. Men of this congregation, I want you to stand. Everybody else stay seated. Men, would you please join me in standing? You are the ones. You are the ones that God has called. can actually model the Word of God. That you don't have to be absent for 25 years while Grandma prays for you to get right with God. That you can actually be the leaders. Come on. Come on. Stand. Stand. I want to pray with you and over you and I ask everyone in this congregation to pray for the men on this call. I receive this Word today. I receive this Word of God today. That you will be the supporting pillars to lead. All women are going to have leadership roles in this place too. You better believe it. They are warriors. Come on. But men, God has called out and has spoken over you prophetically that this call will be different. That you will not be absent. That you will be there. Come on. Supporting 
to move. Amen. Join with me and pray over the men of God in the house today. Listen. Are you perfect? Nope. How did she describe that? An imperfect man. But trust a perfect God. That's all you got to do right now. Well, I haven't done this. I haven't been that. I haven't, I haven't displayed or modeled like I should. It's all in the past. Today you step out of this place forward being a pillar that God's called you to be. Come on. Me? Are you sure he's talking about me? He speak. You could have been anywhere else in the world today. You're right here as he's speaking over your life. You are that important. Well, I'm 80 years old. Go on. You're that important. I'm 15. You're that important. Amen. Come on. You're a man of God. Come on, people of God. Hallelujah. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus. We pray for the men of God. We pray for your sons today. Lord, we don't know everything to do. We don't know how to fix everything. We don't know what to do next. In a lot of cases, as this world spins out of control, we don't have all the answers. But Lord, we want strength today to trust you like we never have been. Lord, we want strength today to pull out of whatever it is tomorrow that keeps us from listening to that still, small voice. Father, I pray that you would go to the men of God tomorrow and beckon them to the secret place. That they may hear your voice and move according to your word. Father, let a new thing begin this morning. Let there be a cutting away of everything that's been tried to project upon the men. And let them walk out of this place afresh and anew. Going forward and saying, I will be the man that you've called me to be. But I can't be it on my own. I'm just trusting you to do it. You showed me a new way of life today. Father, we thank you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. One more time. Men of God, you need some prayer this morning. And the people of God, just surround the men in this place today. Come on, get up. We're going to dismiss this way. Get up and move to the men that are standing right now. And I want you to pray over their lives because how important they are this morning. Come on. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you. Just find some men of God. Surround them right now. Come on. Help me out now. Help me out now. We got, a, we got Jonathan over here. Need somebody praying with him this morning. Come on. Come on. We got Joe. Y'all break away from your family and help me pray this morning. Samantha, move. Come on. Break away. If you need to break away from your husband, break away from your husband. We want to pray over the men of God today. Come on. Your, your husband knows you got your back. Come on. You don't know, you know, put up with him for 30 years. <laughs> He knows you're there. Come on. Somebody get over here with Johnny this morning. Come on. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Right now. Come on. Just pray as the Lord leads you to pray over the man that's right before you right now. Father, we thank you for these men. Lord, we pray a strength in their life like they have never known before. Lord, we, we pray that anything that's come against them right now in this season, that it would be cut away. It will be cut away right now. Father, just make them move right now. Anything that has come against them to try to mold them into something that they're not. Father, something other than your plan for their lives. Lord, we pray that there would be a great cutting away right now. Just a falling off that they can walk out of this place light, trusting you. Father, knowing that the answer their family needs is going to be given by you. The move that their family needs is going to be moved by you as they lean in and trust you. Father, I pray that they would just, 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 just press into you. Lean into you. Let them know your voice. Let them know your leading. That everything that they walk would uplift and uphold. Oh Lord, what you have called them to stand. We thank you. 
we honor you. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Tell the man of God that you just pray for. You love him today. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God is good in the house today. Listen. He alone is your rock. Amen. He alone is your refuge. He alone. And you walk. Hallelujah. Forward in him. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for the beauty. Lord God, of your love and your truth and your scripture unto us today. Lord, let us all, let us all as a family walk from this place today in a new way of life. Lord, not leaning on our own understanding, but putting all of our trust in you, allowing your glory to be maximum, because we know you're working a maximum benefit for our lives. Thank you, Father. Lead us today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you is our prayer. We'll see you in the midweek conversation. Trust in Him alone. He's God. God bless you.